with us on this first Saturday of the new year. Happy New Year, everybody. I am so tickled to see you. I'm going to unshare the screen here because we've got, stop share, there we go. Hey, we've got a lot to talk about today. We've got a packed show and this, I'm calling this like the overview show because we're going to cover a lot of topics today, but not a single one of them in depth. Okay. And this is, it's like a survey course. You remember when you were in high school or college, you took a class that was called 101. And this, and it was just a survey class to introduce you to a lot of topics that you needed to know something about. Well, here's the deal today. We are going to, for the next hour, look at a lot of real estate investor topics that I think you need to know something about to succeed as a real estate professional or as a real estate agent or as a real estate investor or as a real estate property manager, any of the above. And um, not all of these are going to apply to you. That's okay. All right. You don't have to, this, everything on here is not going to apply to you. So, but this hour, I want to talk about subject areas that you'll want to learn about. And I would like you to, as we go through them, say, yeah, yo, okay, there's one. That's one I really don't know much about. And I would like you, I'm not a big believer in New Year's resolutions, but I am a believer in um, setting goals on a regular basis and saying, here's where I am, here's where I'd like to be, here are the steps I need to take to get there. And one, they need to be realistic steps and realistic goals, but they also need to make you stretch just a little bit, sometimes make you stretch a lot. So as we go through these topics today, I want you to jot down the ones you want to know more about, that you want to go more in depth. We're going to have about 40 or 50 topics in the next hour. And guess what? There are about 50 weeks in the next year. And so if you will, after the show, share with me the topics that you'd like to learn more about and go into, I will do two things. One, I'll try to put it on the agenda. And two, I'll try to find an industry expert. For example, um, if you wanted to know more about 1031 tax deferred exchanges, I was having a conversation with my business partner, Hans Trupp, just yesterday. And he was saying, you know, uh, that John Mangum guy really knows his stuff. You're, you're not kidding, he does. And John Mangum, I think, is one of the easiest to understand um, instructors in the field of 1031 of anybody I've ever met. Um, he is able to take a complex topic and a 1031 is a complex topic. And, and he can basically put that in terms that, that I can understand. I'm working on my microphone here. There, that's much better. So um, let's dive right in um, after we thank once again, Enrique Madre. What's it? What did I say his name was? Enrique Madriguera and his Hotel Baltimore Orchestra. Wonderful, wonderful. We need to get some bubbles on this show. We, this, this could be like Lawrence Welk of the radio. All right, well, here we go. And we're, we're just going to fly today because we've got so much to cover. Ian Robbins is, I hope, going to be with us in the second hour because we're going to do exactly the same thing for... Um, for landlording um, uh, that we're doing this hour for real estate in general. So, and Peter Burke is going to be with us and Peter will be here this hour. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure when, but it'll come to me. So 
don't you like that? You just, you got to love that. Except it always starts over. All right, here we go. We're getting started now. Stand by. God gave you 100,000 watts of power, but it's up to you to put them to work. This is the John Adams Radio Show. Camera's not on. Bringing you truth, justice, and the American way of making money. I'm John Adams. Seated firmly in the free enterprise chair, speaking directly into the golden EMR microphone, this is Excellence in Money Radio. Coming to you live from an undisclosed location in a bunker somewhere in the southeastern United States, perhaps Southern Command headquarters on beautiful St. Simons Island, the crown jewel of Georgia's coastal empire. Thence broadcast 23,300 miles directly into outer space. This week affiliates, SATCOM 5. Thence rebroadcast all across the fruited plain to our vast EMR network. 331 stations plus the island of Guam. That's just the way it is. I am thrilled to have you with us for this special edition of the John Adams Radio Show. Let not your hearts be troubled. We will solve your real estate problems today. And I'm hoping you're enjoying that actual photo of me standing in front of the Stars and Stripes. I think it's interesting that um, at no time during George Reeves' life did we have 50 states, but that's a 50-star flag if I've ever seen one. So something is, is incongruous there, but that's all right. We shall for... Ahead. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Pony back. There. Now, I do need to warn you that the views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the opinion of station management, but they should because this program makes more sense than anything else out there. And we need to forge ahead. Special thanks to our sponsors. All your lending questions should go directly to our gold sponsor, Peter Burke. And my advice is to pick up and pick up the phone and call Peter at his easy to remember phone number, 678-557-9759. Now, you know, a lot of lenders will get something like um, 999-555-2021. Not Peter. He has a powerful phone number that, I mean, yes, it takes a little extra brain power to remember it, but look at all you get. You get great service, low prices, low closing costs, and um, the honor of what, well, never mind. Uh, nothing, in any case, you'll enjoy talking to Peter, and there's no obligation. And he works on weekends, just like I do, and just like you do, probably. So call him up, 678-557-9759. He is standing by even as we speak. And then, of course, my friend Bill Preston at American Comfort Heating, Cooling, and Air Quality, 678-809-7959, bringing comfort to America one house at a time. I like that. That. Peter, you should adopt bringing money to America or to Americans one, one, 
loan at a time. Now, I like that. That's We may have to put that to a vote. Your first question should be, who the heck is John Adams and why should you listen to me? And the answer, of course, as you know, is I've been around a long time and uh, I've actually done pretty well. Um, I did write a little book called The Landlord Survival Guide, but most importantly, I am an Eagle Scout, and that means I am trustworthy. You could trust me with your wife, your son, even your daughter, even overnight at a Red Roof Inn at the corner of Buford Highway in Claremont. Nothing would happen, for I am trustworthy. In fact, they'd be safer probably than with you. Uh, so, so much for that. All right, listen, real quick, listen to this. Andrew Carnegie, Scottish businessman. This guy made so much money. He was one of the so-called robber barons of the 19th century. 90%. This guy made what is the equivalent today of billions and billions and billions, starting to sound like whatever that guy was, that Carl Sagan billions and billions of dollars. Um, he says 90% and, and he did it in steel. He owned a little company called US Steel. 90% of all millionaires become so through owning real estate. <clears throat> Got that? And he goes on to say that the wise young man or woman or wage earner of today invests his money in real estate. I couldn't agree more. He's absolutely right. And the truth is, landlords grow rich in their sleep. And that's one of the things you should be doing, is figuring out a way to grow rich in your sleep. Because if you don't, what that means is you're going to work until the day you die, trading hours for dollars. What's on our agenda today? We're going to talk about... Um, starting with your exit strategy in mind, working toward perfect credit, blah, blah, blah. All of these are areas that you're going to want to know something about in this business. And then in the second hour, we'll be talking with Ian Robbins in our landlord hour, but we've got a lot to cover. By the way, if you have a question, um, I'll be happy to put you on the air. And the way you do that is to Margie, raise their hand. Uh, yes. All right. If you'd like to go on the air with me, all you have to do is raise your hand and Margie will hopefully see it and, uh, and put you on the air. Alternatively, if you would just like to ask a question and not be on the air with me, you can do that by chatting. So I'm right now going to go look for example. Oh, I'm sorry, Q&A, not chat. Boy, we got to get this figured out. I guess this is like the first time we've used this platform. Um, Q&A for questions, and I will answer those live. But if you would like to be on the air with me, just raise your hand. I'm going to look right now and see. We have a large crowd today. And at this moment, there are no hands raised. <clears throat> so we don't have a problem. So there we go. Um, and if you have a Q and a question, Margie will work on that. All right. Okay. So the buy and hold strategy that we have covered in the past, I just want to remind you, some people call it the B R R R R R R R R method. And essentially, you're buying a house at a price below market value. You're going to renovate the house um, to repair or to enhance the home. And invariably, that involves a fresh coat of paint and maybe some floor coverings and um, maybe new lighting or something like that. I mean, that, that would really pretty much be the minimum. Although occasionally you find a house where that's already been done, that's usually a sophisticated seller, okay? And they're not going to be flexible on their price. Then once you get that done, and it, it doesn't have to be expensive, and you can do this work yourself. I don't recommend it, but you can do this work yourself. Then you rent the home to establish cash flow. 
And that's the income that we have been talking about. Um, at that point, once you are making a nice positive cash flow on the property, you refinance the home to get cash out to buy more property. In other words, you have added value to the property by the things that you have done. Um, some of that is natural appreciation. Some is forced appreciation. When you paint the property, it is worth more because you forced it to be worth more. If you put in solid gold plumbing fixtures, it's not worth more because you wasted your money on solid gold plumbing fixtures, thinking somebody would pay more rent for them, but they won't. So now you pull cash out, step number four, by refinancing. And that's where our friend Peter Burt comes in because he's a specialist in that. And then you repeat the process. And my life experience has shown that even though I did everything wrong, you can still become a millionaire if you just buy a house a year for 10 years. You're saying, wait a minute, I wanted to get rich quick. Well, you're in the wrong place because this is not the place where you're going to get rich quick. The plan I'm talking about is get rich slow. So income underpins all of it. It's if you didn't have income, this would not work. But the great thing about real estate is it generates income because people will rent it. Either, I mean, you can live there. Uh, I know plenty of people who buy a house a year, move into it, live there for a full year. Meanwhile, they're fixing it up on evenings, weekends, um, learning how to do all these things at the big box store, at the big hardware stores where they teach every weekend, how to do ceramic tile, how to do roofing, how to paint. I know you think you know how to paint, but underneath all of this is income. And you've got an asset that you can rent that pays for itself. And the tenant ends up buying your investment for you, which I really like. Next, depreciation and other tax benefits we have talked about. Um, and of course, equity buildup over time. Remember, you're paying down the loan every month. This is part of the genius of getting rich while you sleep. Appreciation, I've already mentioned. Economic, which just occurs over time, hopefully. And then forced. We also know from uh, the last 20-year experience, real estate does not always go up in value. So we have to be prepared. This is not a short-term investment. This is a long-term investment. And leverage is what makes it powerful. And this is what uh, John Mangum was talking about a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to get back to him on leverage next week. So um, the basis of our, our conversation almost every week is that you can retire comfortably on as few as 10 rental units. And here's a, a very cute little rental. It's not a big house. It's not a new house, but it's in a neighborhood that's doing great. And we've always been able to keep it rented. I do want you to know that the 2021 Landlord Survival Guide is out. We have changed the, as is our custom, we have changed the cover color to indicate that this is a different package. And if you would like to get one, you should go directly. We've got a special going on this week only. Go to realestatecoffeebreak.com and click on webinar specials. It's only $197. And for those of you who are renewing your membership and want to get the 2021 new and improved killer lease, I've got a special deal for you as well. So go take a look at what's available, and we'll talk more about that later if we want to. So start with your exit strategy in mind. Uh, I think you're wanting to work toward perfect credit. You're wanting to consider using your IRA or solo 401k. You need to see a lot of houses. You need to determine whether or not you're going to be able to expect a 300 or $350 positive cash flow. That really ought to be 300 I think 350 is... Um, going to be harder to achieve. Uh, you're going to need to make a lot of offers and you're going to need to pick the right property. And then you're going to need to keep the property full. And finally, I want you to stop 
paying taxes. So let's look at each of these areas. And I'd like you to look for an area that in 2021, you want to learn more about. You know, the most successful real estate investors are generalists. They're sort of like um, um, doctors who are internists. They, they treat a lot of different things, but they're not specialists. And you as a real estate investor should not be a specialist. For example, you don't want to know as much about 1031 exchanges as John Mangum knows. First, it would kill you. That is, it's, it would be unsafe. He is a highly trained tax professional and for many years has trained his brain to control all of these facts. But if you or I tried it, our brain would explode. Same thing with Peter Burke, a highly trained lending professional who knows everything there is to know about lending. You and I, if we tried to learn all that from Peter Burke, our brains would explode. That's why we keep them around. So let's talk about it. Let's start with your goal or your exit strategy in mind. What is that all about? Well, first, I want you to supplement your regular income. This is so important. You have to be able to save. You have to live on what you're earning now. And if you're like most people, you've got a regular day job where you're trading hours for dollars. This is really good coffee. Thank you. Um, and you have to learn to live within your means so that you can set some money aside because being able to save, in my opinion, is a prerequisite to real estate investing. So that means getting your budget under control. That means recognizing what your income is and what your outgo is. And that may mean um, doing some something part-time, may mean doing something on the side. It may mean writing an Amazon ebook and selling it on Kindle. I don't know what you want to do, but um, I do a lot of different stuff. And um, we can talk about that if that's an area you want to go into. Next, I want you to think about replacing your current income. What is that current income? Well, if that went away, or if, if you were injured or, or something like that, that might be a real disaster. How can we go about replacing, excuse me, replacing that income? And there are a lot of different ways to do it. But one is, uh, let's say you're making $3,000 a month, or you're making $6,000 a month, 72000 a year. Um and you are able to get $300 a month positive cash flow, you would need 20 houses to do that. 10 houses would be a very nice supplement to your current income. Um, so I don't know, what, what's, what's it gonna take for you? Number three, I want you to decide whether you're focused on cash flow, which is monthly, at the end of the month, is there money left over? At the end of the year, did the revenue from the house cover all of the income or was there a shortfall? That's called negative cash flow. Positive cash flow is if the property is spinning off cash on an annual basis, negative cash flow is where you're actually losing money. The rent doesn't cover the ownership costs. That's not good. And again, we said, I'd love for you to have a positive cash flow target of about $300 a month, or maybe both. Uh, for example, what am I talking about here? There are condos, there are, are places in Metro Atlanta. And by the way, we're on beautiful St. Simons Island, the crown jewel of Georgia's coastal empire. Um, there are places in Atlanta, which where, where there are literally thousands of relatively poorly built condominiums that the place failed. That so many of them got bought as rental units that the whole thing became a gigantic condominium of rental units. And yet the things are 
spinning off positive cash flow. So you can buy them for about $100,000 each, but you can rent the daggone things for eight and $900 a month, maybe more. And if, with today's financing, yes, you can pull two, $300 a month out of each one. Now, I'm telling you, I don't think they're ever going to go up in value much. I think worrying about an increase in value is a mistake on that property, just because it has no history of going up. It's great as a rental property. It's not good as an ownership property because people don't want to live in a rental community. So um, that would be a cash flow. All, there are places you can buy where you can't get a positive cash flow, but the properties are going up so fast in value that you may want to own something there and just have break even cash flow. Or is it possible to find both? Well, that's harder to do, but that would be an area that you might want to learn more about. Number four, how many houses is this going to take? Um, my recommendation is that you buy a house a year for 10 years and then you stop and see where you are. I think you're going to be stunned. You, you will have more revenue and more net worth than you ever dreamed possible after 10 years. Uh, at that point, if you want to stop, you can stop. If you want to sell everything and start over, you can. If you want to keep everything and decide to buy Another 10 houses, you can do that. I love the one house a year formula because it's safer. And you are not riding the, the waves, if you will. I get nautical when I get at the beach, you know, waves and so forth. Um, you're not riding the waves of Wall Street where things go up and things go down and even the waves of real estate where things go up and down. If you're buying a house a year and keeping them all, you are essentially dollar cost averaging. So how many houses is it going to take to generate the revenue or the net worth or both that you'd like to see to enable you to say, yes, I have, I am now financially independent. I can make my own choices. I can do with my time what I choose to do with my time. Okay. So that's something you need to think about. And what does retirement look like? You know, there was a time in my life, like when I was 22 and 23, when I thought retirement meant sitting on the front porch in a rocking chair, smoking a pipe, and just being relaxed all the time. I have no interest in that now. And I suspect neither do you. But I'm a lot closer to retirement now. The day will come when I don't want to work anymore. It shall not be this day. Those of you that are Lord of the Rings fans know that was a thinly veiled reference. The day shall come, but it shall not be this day. Okay, anyway, um, I enjoy doing this program. I enjoy buying and renting houses. I enjoy the, the game, and it is a game. And uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, and you can do it until your last breath. So it's entirely up to you. But what does retirement look like? And that's something that we can get into more as the year goes on. Next, let's work toward perfect credit. Why is that important? And um, the first thing I recommend you do is go to creditkarma.com. And Margie, I'm going to go to Peter Burke here. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Oh, yeah, it's half past. Why don't we? Um, that's fine. Um, Peter, raise your hand so Margie will know you're there. And I recommend the first thing you do is go to creditkarma.com. I have been a registered user there since the beginning, and I really like what they have done. And they do not ask for a credit card. You don't have to sign up for anything. Yes, they're going to make you offers. But the good news is they will show you exactly what two of your credit reports look like. They show you what your credit scores are. They tell you what things are hurting you. 
They tell you what you could do to improve your credit score. And it really gives you an overview of what's happening without having to pay for it. And there's no reason to pay for it. And I like creditkarma.com. There are a number of other ones. They, I don't get paid by them and there's nothing magic about them. Um, but I, I like creditkarma.com. I also like, there's a website called my fico.com my it's m y f i c o.com forward slash uh credit education or you can just go to my fico.com and then click on credit education i fico is fair isaac and company and i think they have the best educational materials i've ever seen on what constitutes what factors make up your credit score and to what extent. For example, the, the length that you have had credit counts less than your payment history. And they'll tell you all that. And it's part of their formula. No, they don't go into the great details of the algorithms and all that, but they give you a general idea, which is very helpful in understanding where your credit score comes from. And it's so important to have a good credit score. And you need to get pre-qualified with a lender now. Um, but I think it's very important to get pre-qualified with a lender right now, because if you're not ready to take action, when the time comes, uh, guess what? It, it, there's no time. If your neighbor comes next door to you and says, hey, um, I know you didn't know this about me, but I have $2 million in gambling debts in Las Vegas, and the mafia has told me I have to come to work at the um, uh, Bellagio Hotel and work for the mob starting tomorrow, and I have to sell my house today, no matter what it takes, and uh, I'm willing to just let you take over the payments. That happened to me. That happened to me where a friend of mine said, look, I got to sell my house. I got to sell it quick. I don't care. Just take over the payments. If you can give me a couple thousand bucks, that'd be great. And I bought his house. I own it to this day. It's been one of the best investments I have ever made. But it's because I was ready to take action. If, you, if I had said to him, oh, I need to call Peter Burke and find out if I'm qualified, and we're, now then I need to pull a credit report, and then I need to do all this, that, and the other, he just said, forget it. I'll sell it. I got to sell now because people who are willing to be flexible on their price or their terms or both are moving in a hurry. Okay? So I think that's very important that you do that. Next. I want you to meet with a hard money lender. Now, hard money is money that you borrow short term to help. It's, it's also like a bridge loan. You may have heard it called that. They're usually six months in duration, sometimes three, but six, I think, is more common. And um, uh, I changed it. Peter Burke. Now, I'm hearing Peter, so that's a good thing. Okay. We must. All right, well, let's go back and, and see if, if we can hear Peter, because I'm hearing him through my screen. Peter, how are you, my friend? I am doing well. Can, can you hear me, John? Yes. I apologize. No, 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 it's not a problem. I can hear you, and, and it's a joy and an honor and a privilege to be able to hear you. I uh, had a such, I, I am the administrator, the Zoom administrator for a men's Bible study at our church. And one week, my microphone was broken. And the preacher said, this is a condition that many of us have prayed for for quite some time. So <laughs> I'm, I'm held That's in true. high esteem and low regard at the church. Yes. Um, yes. I figure if I just associate with better people, that's that's bound to help. Of course, of course. Peter, you meet every week, probably almost every day, with 
would be investors who are trying to get pre-qualified. Why sure. is that important? What does that look like? And what does it enable the prospective investor to be able to do? Okay, so starting off with why, it's because sellers want to make sure that they are dealing with a qualified buyer before they execute that purchase and sale agreement. So, uh, and so that's an important step. They don't want to negotiate with you. Uh, what's it look like? It looks like um, we are reviewing our credit report that we have obtained on your behalf at our expense, by the way, because we don't charge for pre-qualifying you. So we are obtaining our credit report. We are looking at your pay stubs, tax returns, and um, asset statements, bank statements and the like primarily. And we are reviewing to make sure that you have the capacity to complete the transaction you are trying to complete, whether it's a purchase or a refinance. And um, what I love about this is once you already have all of this documentation that you need, once um, you have gathered, and there's a lot of stuff, let's just be honest. There's yes. There's, you know, a lot of pieces of paper that come from a lot of different places. But once right. you have all this together, um, how does that put you in a different position than somebody who is coming to you for the first time saying, well, I want to see if I can buy this rental house next door? Generally, it gives us speed and efficiency moving ahead. We, we know what your capacity is. We've done things before and um, we can quickly retrieve data and say, okay, we see what you're doing. You sold this property, you're buying this one. We don't envision that there'll be too much in the way of issues for you to move ahead. So and there's a familiarity of, um, of understanding our customer. One of the things I really like about your process is that um, you guys at, at, uh, at Reliant Mortgage work with a lot of real estate investors. You're familiar right. with the process. I, early in my career, before I had the honor and privilege to meet you, I worked with a, uh, a lender that the agent on the other side of the transaction recommended. And I was the buyer. I was not only an agent, but I was the buyer. And I didn't have anybody, which was foolish on my part, but they said, oh, oh, we want, we want you to use this person. So I, what the heck, what's the difference? And this person had never worked with an investor before. Are there differences between underwriting a loan for a real estate investor and underwriting a loan for a owner occupant? And if so, how, how substantial? Absolutely. Absolutely. And because we're a broker, we have uh, in our uh, that we do business with the lender slash investors that we know what's important to them and what's not critical to them. And so which lender to use for that customer buying that investment property, as opposed to going to a bank who doesn't have that flexibility and might have overlays as it relates to Fannie Mae guidelines, overlays are rules that that lender has added on top of what Fannie Mae has, um, which can make it more onerous. So there is some benefit of using a, a broker in this environment because we know who does what to whom. And this is a, a mortgage broker as opposed to what? a bank or a lender that only underwrites for loans that they retain themselves. They may have onerous restrictions, as in the case of some of the big banks out there, it may be very hard to get an investor loan compared to what a broker can provide. And right. generally and at more competitive rates too. 
we're, Absolute, we're more competitive. Absolutely. Now, let's talk briefly about the importance of that credit score, because I think perhaps the biggest change I've seen in my lifetime, the first house that Margie and I bought, I took over a loan from Tucker Federal that had been originated by Tucker Federal and was being serviced by Tucker Federal. And the seller was a friend of my father's and he picked up the phone and called the president of the bank at Tucker Federal and said, I want to sell this to this boy and I want him to take over the loan. Mm -hmm. And so I got out there and I had no job. Mm -hmm. I, I had no job. I had no income. This was in 1897. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not kidding. He said, son, you don't have a job. And I said, well, I'm, I'm doing a number of different things now. And he said, well, he said, uh, uh, what does your daddy do for a living? And I said, well, he's a uh, professor of music at Agnes Scott College. And he said, well, that's probably good enough. I'm going to approve this. Is that the way it goes now? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and that's both good and bad. That's both good and bad. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me the importance of the credit score and why, you know, I have proved and you're aware of it and you may have done it yourself. You can buy real estate uh, using other people's money. It doesn't have to come from an institutional lender, but um when interest rates are as low as they are right now and the banks or the federal government is willing to guarantee them for 30 years, it makes sense to take advantage of that right now, doesn't it? Correct. It does. Yes. So yes. what, talk to me about credit scores. What, what would be a good score? What would be a so-so score and what would be a stinko score? You know, if you have scores that were the middle score, because there's three scores, because there's three uh, providers of scoring, and lenders always throw out the high, the low, and look at the physical middle score. So if you've got a middle score of 740 and above, the expectation is, is that you will get the best rate on your loan. You will get... Um, typically the higher loan to value opportunities of putting down less money on a purchase. Um, 720 and above, uh, you'll still get very good rates and still get opportunities, but you might have restrictions on loan to values. 700, the same might be a little bit dropped down. When you drop below 700 and get into 680, you should still be able to complete transactions but you might feel a little pain in your interest rate. Below 680, you might run into struggles as it relates to an investor property trying to get a loan done. I understand. All right, and um, real quickly here, because we have just run out of time. This always happens because I just enjoy chatting with you um, and, and the information is so good. One of the things that you do, Peter, I believe, is that you um, meet with and talk with over the phone people who just have questions or, or are, are just getting started. How does that work? How do they get in touch with you? And, and what can they expect? You know, generally, I try to answer my phone. And um, so I'm always around. You can call me with a question. Uh, I, I don't have any problem with it. I generally answer it. And if I don't, I'll call you back and you can text me. And um, I think people find that that's the easiest way is you're welcome to pick up the phone. And then, of course, here's my number, if you can see that. There it is. And, and I, there, this is a cryptic uh, number. It has to do with the Da Vinci Code, I think. And look, look, Peter's got the, uh, the, the Carl Rove board. The chalkboard is up 678-557-9759.
Peter, there yes. are people listening right now that have a portfolio of properties that they are very proud that they own free and clear. And they listen to this show. And I say, if you don't lock in some cash right now, you're missing the opportunity of a lifetime. Would you be Correct. willing to talk to any of those people today? Yes, um, they are more than welcome to call me this morning. I'm here just working. So feel free to reach out to me. Not 678 557 9759. Peter Burke, thank you very much. Thank You're you, a gentleman and a scholar, and we appreciate it. Thank you. you. Take care. Okay. So, what's that? All right. Where it's under QA. All right. I'm going to go look at QA right quick and stop sharing and see what we have here under Q&A. Uh, for those of us approaching total retirement, there is the classic exit strategy question. John, take a look at 1031crowdfunding.com. I have actually looked at that. Besides 1031, they do offer a few possibilities to invest in portions of opportunity zones. It would be hands-off an investor would give up control of administrative decisions, not recommending it, but would like to know what your thoughts are. This is um, not dissimilar <clears throat> um, from the um, tick shares, the tenant in common shares. And rather than me rambling on about this, um, and who is this? Oh, Taylor, hi. Um, rather than me rambling on, I'm going to invite John Mangum to address this issue next week. Why don't we do that? And I think that makes sense. So that's all we've got right now. So let's go right back to where we were. Um, and we'll see if we can pick up where we left off. And I'll bet we can. And what I'm going to do is hit this, and then I'm going to go right back up here and get to where we were. And I think we were uh, right here. And we were. So I'm going to click present, and here we go. Hopefully you can see that. Yes, you can. So what we talked about with Peter is working toward perfect credit. Um, going to creditkarma.com to get a free in-depth look at your credit report. Now, I do want to remind everyone who is listening that the credit report that Peter pulls for the purposes of lending <clears throat> is not exactly, well, it's the same report, but it is not the same credit score. So don't be surprised if the number that you get at Credit Karma is not exactly the same number that Peter will pull because his credit report is designed specifically for mortgage lending and specifically uses algorithms that are tailored for that. It certainly should generally reflect the same range. But Peter can go into more details on that than can I, because I don't pretend to know all of the details of credit reporting. Although I used to, used to, why? Used to work for Equifax. Um, I do recommend myfico.com forward slash credit dash education. Very informative. Getting pre-qualified. I'd call Peter today if I were you. And then meet with a hard money lender to put into place your ability to obtain a lot of cash real quickly for a short period of time. And these are called hard money lenders. If you need a recommendation, send me an email. Uh, Peter can also help you find somebody. But a hard money lender will, especially if they know you, if they know who you are and what you've done in the past, they will work with you to provide the cash to acquire the property, the cash to renovate it and fix it up and put a tenant in it. And then after it's been six months, Peter can refinance it for you and pay off the hard money lender. Okay. 
And that's why it's important. Now, you don't always need a hard money lender, but sometimes you do. And um, they're just a very good tool to have. And I think you also need to explore hard money alternatives. And by that, I mean, um, you know, what else is out there? Do you know somebody that has money? Do you have a rich Uncle Bob who said to you, by the way, if you ever need to borrow some money, come see me? Um, I never had that, but, you know, some people do. And it doesn't hurt. It, it's a lot smarter for you to go to your father and say, I'd like to borrow a down payment for a house than to say, I want to buy, borrow the money to buy a new XKE Jaguar. 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 I can never say that word. All right. So we talked to Peter. And I want to cover this before we run out of time. So um, you might want to consider using your IRA or your solo 401k for some of your investing. And it is another tool. Um, this should be the topic of a whole show. This could be the topic of a whole series. But this is a whole nother area that I'd like us to explore sometime to some depth in this year. And I would like you to share with me whether or not this is of interest to you. Um, and here's why. Real estate is an alternative asset that is permitted to be owned by a retirement account. Now, in the case of an IRA, the most common manner in which to purchase real estate is by using a self-directed IRA. And there are plenty of trustees out there that would love to be my guest on this show to explain to you how their company works. Okay. So there's the old equity, uh, there's um, the old Mid-Ohio Securities, which is now Equity Trust Company. There's Advanta, there's, there's all manner of people out there. And um, if you have somebody you really like, let me know about it. If, if there's somebody you've heard speak before and you'd like to get their insight, let me know about it. But essentially, one of these can be opened at a special trust company that will facilitate the IRA investment. This is not something you can do on your own. You will need a trustee. And the benefit of using a self-directed IRA to make real estate investments is that gains or profits connected with that investment won't be taxed until they're distributed during retirement. Or in the case of a Roth IRA, where you've already paid the taxes with the money that you invest, it's after-tax dollars, it's never taxed. You hear me? That's a pretty good deal. So, And the solo 401k is for those of us who are either self-employed or don't have any employees. It's just a family business. And for a lot of real estate professionals, a solo 401k is a great way to go. So that may be something we want to explore. Solo 401ks are much more flexible, and you get the checkbook if you set it up right. How's that? Yes, these things have lots of rules and lots of regulations. But these are some topics that I want you to think about for 2021. I'm going to try to cover one more before the top of the hour. Real quick, you need to see a lot of houses. So how are you going to see a lot of houses? Well, first, you need to understand Zillow. Now, this is my thought about Zillow. Okay, I don't like Zillow. Zillow is trying to put me out of business. They're trying to put you out of business. They're trying to put Peter out of business. But they are realistically a good source of current information, and it's free except for listing your rental, which they are now charging for, but not much compared to the old AJC. You remember that? Whoo! $106 for a three-line ad in the Sunday paper. So you need to learn the ins and outs of Zillow's. You need Zillow, you need to learn how to um, uh, draw a neighborhood 
on the Zillow screen so that you get instant notifications anytime something happens there so that you can stay on top of a neighborhood uh, instantaneously. Um, and Zillow is, is easier to do that than anything else I know that's free. Realtor.com has some of the same capabilities, not all, but they're trying to improve. They have gotten better over the last year. Um, you can hire agents as bird dogs. You need to have a written profile of the house you're looking for. If you don't have a written profile and you come to me and say, John, help me find a house. That's like going into a hardware store and saying, help me find a tool or help me do a project. Well, what is your project? Well, I don't know. Well, how can the guy at the hardware store help you if, he, if you don't know what it is you want to accomplish? Okay, so you need a property profile and we're gonna get to that. But once you have a property profile that says where you wanna live, how much or where you wanna own, how much it should cost to buy, um, what type of employers are nearby, uh, how much you've got to spend, blah, 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 blah. There's no, no reason to approach agents as bird dogs, but once you have that, there's no limit. And there's, trust me, there are a lot of agents who sit around most of the day and do nothing. I know it's hard to believe, but they just sit around most of the day and do nothing. Uh, you need to think outside the box. This is for those of you in Metro Atlanta. What I'm saying here is think outside the perimeter. Don't be afraid to look outside 285. 285 has just gotten inside ITP has gotten so expensive now that it is hard to cash flow those properties. And it's hard to keep them in a range that, that will give you a comfort level for a long haul investment. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying it's a lot easier. You might want to look in Athens. You might want to look in Lawrenceville. You might want to look in Buford or Cumming. You might want to look in Fayetteville or in Fayette County or Clayton County, you might want to look in Augusta. Okay, I'm just telling, I'm just thinking outside the perimeter here. These are some areas that you might want to be looking in. And it opens up a huge possibility for you. And then you need to use, learn to use Google Street View exceedingly well. Google Street View is a fabulous tool, but there are things you need to know about it and um, uh, how to tour the neighborhood and get a real good idea of what the neighborhood looks like is something that will reward you many times by pointing out something that's a war zone so you don't even have to drive out there. There's no, if it's a war zone, there's no reason for you to drive out there. Maybe we ought to have a show one day on what, what constitutes a war zone. Okay. Cause I've got some very specific criteria. Um, and you also need to learn how to understand and listen for seller motivation. Peter was right. They're not going to want to fool around with you if you're not ready to take action. So you need to get ready now and be able to get right to the point of why are you selling? What's this all about? And I know they may say it's none of your business, okay? Uh, it is your business. You need to know so you can try to help them. So that is where we got to this week. Next week, we're going to pick up with can you expect $300 a month? In the meantime, we are going to take a very short break. Um, um, and we're going to go to our intermission after that. Here it is. Um, after that, we are going to, here we go. I'll just conclude with this for this hour. How about that? There you go. Uh, remember, we're just talking about little houses here. I don't want anybody to get, you know, nervous or whatever. I love this sign. Keep calm. It's not rocket science. You don't have to have a PhD to do very well 
in this business. It's just a little house. Okay. I mean, almost everybody, you know, has either lived in one or knows somebody who has lived in one. So you've already got experience with it, you know, and here's that strategy buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. If you buy a house a year for 10 years, you will be a wealthy individual who has achieved financial independence. Or are you trading hours for dollars or working for somebody else? Most people do. And I think that's sad. I'm, I don't mind if you do now. I believe in the dignity of work. I believe in, in, in all work is, is a good thing for people to be engaged in. But at some point, you got to find a way to make money while you sleep. So are you trading hours for dollars? There's our good friend, Abraham Lincoln. And if you are, now's the time to think about what it would take to start doing that less. Okay, let's take a short break. <laughs> 